I find it fun to try to understand the conventional wisdom that I don't understand. And one of them is that Israel is a bad guy. And there is, a, a, you know, many people do believe that. And I've, I've come across a person who is um, an expert. He's a historian and the author of a book called Torn Lilacs um, on the history of this area that we call Israel, Palestine, whatever. And so um, it is my pleasure, without further ado, to introduce Henry Mikulski. Good morning, Marty. Thank you for having me. My pleasure. Okay, you're the historian guy. Start at the beginning. <laughs> Adam and Eve. <laughs> Not quite. <laughs> well, to understand the Middle East, which is a very complex, complicated area of the world to understand, one has to be grounded in history and know a little bit. And I'm personally appalled at the lack of knowledge. People spring to conclusions. Israel's an apartheid colonial occupying power. They have no idea what they're talking about. Let's go back to the beginning. First of all, the Jewish people are indigenous to that part of the world. Just like the Hindus come from India and the, you know, the Incas come from Peru, etc. Everybody comes from somebody, somewhere. Uh, so we are indigenous to that part of the world. <clears throat> and for thousands of years, it was called Judea. It's the land of the Bible. It's where Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Leah, Rachel, where all that history was developed there. Not in Milwaukee, not in Siberia. It happened right there in what we call Israel today. Okay. Uh, so it was Judea for a long time. The Romans, during the Roman occupation, when they were gathering colonies all over the Roman lake. This is before Christ. This is something like a thousand. Yeah, like around the time, BC around the time of Christ, right around there, when mm -hmm. the Romans really tried to, uh, and the Jewish uh, resistance, uh, uh, Jews put up a tremendous resistance. You know the story of Masada, very popular. Historians used to wrote... What is it? What is the story? I mean, what Jewish resistance, Masada... To, uh, they were in a place at the Dead Sea. It was a flat... It was a, uh, a mesa, a flat plateau. Mm. And a few thousand zealots or Jews were up there refusing to give in to the Roman occupation. And they held out for years. I see. And the Romans eventually wiped them all out. I see. Committed mass suicide. It's a sacred place for Jews today as a place of... The Jews committed mass suicide? Yeah, rather than given to the, they uh, grouped themselves in groups of 10. Wow. And one person in each group killed each other and then himself. Wow. They committed mass suicide oh rather God. than submit to Roman occupation. Wow. This was their land. Why were they so hell bent on, I mean, that's a pretty heavy price there was. So well, many people that's why they're called zealots. <laughs> they were, wow. they were steeped in their religion and they decided, and their lifestyle, their culture, wow. and their way of life, language. They weren't going to give in okay. to a Roman. Okay. Uh, to these uh, heathens, as they were. Um, it, the Romans expended a lot, a, a lot of energy to conquer Judea. Wow. And um, as a punishment for the, uh, for the resistance, they destroyed the great temple in Jerusalem, mm. wiped it out, mm. uh, looted the place, mm. took all the stuff back mm. to Italy, mm. and uh, killed people. They say the blood was up to your, your, your ankles in Jerusalem. Henry, I've got to say, I and appreciate they, the detail. This is and, very good. And they exiled the Jewish people to the four corners of the world. Why Jews are now scattered all over the world. Mm. You can go to a synagogue anywhere in the world. You can go to Uganda, there's a synagogue. You can go mm. to Peru, and you will pray in the same language mm. as they do in Jerusalem, as we have in 3,000 years. The Jews can say rightfully that the only people for the last 3,000 years pray to the same God in the same religion on the same soil. Of course, Christians also for thousands, and maybe not 3,000, but Christians and Muslims also, and Hindus, I'm sure, you know, they also have a long tradition. Sure. Well, the three Abrahamic religions, Christianity and Islam, are offshoots of Judaism. It came from uh, the Torah, from the old Jews. Um, so in the... <clears throat> Somehow, one of the great miracles of humankind is how the Jewish people held their culture, their people, their religion together in diaspora without a government, without a military. Uh, they were a hated minority almost everywhere they went. They were despised. Didn't all religions, I mean, I think about there are Muslims all over the world, there are Christians all over the world. Well, what, what, let's walk me through that from the historic perspective. You... Uh, what they were it was called Judea, and then it could change. What, what happened there? The name was changed to Palestine by the Romans from the word Philistine. The Philistines oh. were in the Gaza area, 
and they were the most ardent enemy of the Jews. So to really punish the Jews, they renamed the area of Palestine and scattered the Jews to the four corners. So you're saying the Palestinians originally really were the Jews of just a renaming yeah, of the Jews? for 2,000 years, the Jews were the Palestinians. I didn't know that. In 1972, when the terrorist Yasser Arafat first articulated when Arafat first articulated the term uh, Palestinian state, I, I, I <laughs> did a double take. I said, what? I never heard that term before. A Palestinian state? There's already 39 Arab states in the world. There's 57 predominantly Muslim states in the world. One more in... There's only one Jewish country established in 1948. Let's go back in history a little bit, okay? Please. Because for, for 2,000 years, Jews lived scattered throughout the world in diaspora. <laughs> Excuse me one second. And ended their, uh, their Passover Seder prayers with next year in Jerusalem. They had that ardent love for Jerusalem. Uh, and the old temple and the resurrection of the temple and to go back to their ancient promised land because they're the indigenous people. This is where it all happened. We're going to have to fast forward now to World War I. During the war, at the height of the war, the British Empire issued what we call the Balfour Declaration after Lord uh, Balfour uh, head of the Exchequer, who said essentially his man. Now the head of the Exchequer, I just recently uh, learned, that's the number two guy in, in, no, in, in yeah, Britain, right? Kind of the, okay. The, the, okay basically saying his majesty's government looks with pleasure upon the establishment of a jewish state in palestine for the jewish people and what a great celebration what a great day why did they do that why why at the end of world war one did suddenly the british say we we believe that there's the, a lot the, of pressure on the british government Chaim weitzman was a a british jewish uh, chemist to help the british win the war he had some ious out there for two thousand years the jews were badgering all the world leaders uh, uh, to, to, for, for the for the love of their country to return to Zion to go back to their go homeland. To, so was, there was was there support? Was it just something that the, you know uh, Chaim Weitzman um, extracted out of Britain? He made a statement, or was there worldwide support? I think there for was this? worldwide was there... support, and indeed, when Israel was reestablished in 1948, there was tremendous uh, outpouring of joy and hope. And many historians postulated that this is one of the great events in all of human history. Okay, I want to say that it. people could come back to their ancient promised land and reestablish okay. after a 2,000 year absence. I want to say, so between 1917 right. and 1948, what occurred and what led this United Nations declaration that there would be this one Jewish state? In what Israel? happened was the Ottoman Empire was on the wrong side of the First World War what we call the Great War. At that they time. were supporting of the Germans? They were with the Germans and the Austrian Hungarians. They were on the wrong side. So at Versailles, where they wanted to exact some kind of punishment, mm. the big four dismembered the Ottoman Empire I see. and handed over what we call mandates. For example, uh, Egypt, which was then part of the British, was given to the British Empire as a mandate. Palestine was given to the British. Lebanon to the French. Syria to the French. Mesopotamia, which we now call Iraq, was given to the British, etc. So Israel and to establish governments, yeah, because this is post-war and new governments were being all over Africa as well. Got Independent it. states, the colonial empires. It was the end of the empires. So this was a way in which the Ottoman Empire, this large Turkish-based empire, after they were as part of the reparations, if you will. For, for being in favor of the, the Germans, the pre-Nazis, the, the world government allocated that Ottoman Empire to various countries, including, at that point, Israel being, or at that time called Palestine, but being allocated to the British, and then the British said, okay, this is a Jewish state. Is that and correct? the British had a mandate. What does mandate mean? They had to create something, a Jewish state. I see. Uh, all those areas were colonized. Now, this was the emergence of new states. Not Africa, throughout the Middle East, new countries were being born and created. Like okay. India and Pakistan, one of the great migrations of all time, switching populations. Mm. So, um, so Israel... Uh, remind me where we are. With, with okay, we're we're trying to fill in the gap between so, so after World War One, 
The British okay. got c- right. control of this little area called Israel, and they said, the Balfour Declaration says, yes, this is <laughs> under our mandate, right. under our supervision, but it is a Jewish correct. state. Is that correct? And, correct. And by the 1930s, with the rise of Hitlerism in Europe, mm. many, what we call Halitzeum, the early pioneers, had to go through the British blockade. The British did not want Jewish refugees coming into what they considered Arab Why? lands. Well, there's a lot of pressure on the Arab. The Arab world put a ton of pressure on the British Empire. They didn't want Jews, foreigners, coming into what they considered their land. But I thought that the, that the British said it was going to be Jewish land. Why would they prohibit <coughs> Jews from coming what they, in? What the British did is they took 82% of what was then Palestine, 82%, and they created out of fiction a place called Transjordan to pacify the Hashemite kingdom. The Hashemites were basically Bedouins. They were a minority. Was this part of Israel? 82% of 82% that area of, of what Palestine, was that? It was historic Palestine. 82%, the other side of the Jordan River, they gave them all of that territory. And the last 18%, they left for the early pioneers. For the Jewish work out. Yeah, the, the, the uh, people that from Europe were coming in now to settle the land. Um, so they changed their mind. They went from uh, giving a, a little bigger sliver of land in 1918 with the Balfour Declaration, and then in the 30s they said, "Here's 82 percent of it. Here's this is going to be Muslim yeah. land. Is that correct?" Yeah, Arab yeah, land? yeah. Okay. Then they created Jordan. 18 percent of old Palestine was left for the Jews and Arabs to fight over. And that's the current. Meanwhile, Israel. yeah. Meanwhile. Uh, Thousands and thousands of Jews now were smuggling into what was then Palestine. It was a neglected backwater of the Ottoman Empire. That 18%. It didn't have cities, highways, infrastructure of a state, nothing. There was Desert. nothing there. It was mosquito infested swamps. I see. The pioneers came and they worked like crazy. If you read some of the literature at that time, the Arabs were sitting smoking their hookahs, laughing at these people, saying, these people are crazy. Mosquito infested swamps. And as soon as they started growing tomatoes the size of basketballs, all of a sudden I'm a Palestinian. This is my land. In 1972 in Arafat, the So terrorists... I want to back up a minute. So, okay. so you're saying that that 18% that was left by the British for the Jews was swampland, but the Jews were very diligent in air, figure, turning it into arable land, and they create. And you then say that at that point, how could the Arabs claim it was their land? <laughs> they say that uh, the Arabs lived there for thousands of years in in tiny little villages, Jericho, places like that. There was no Tel Aviv. There was no like a real state. It was part of the Ottoman Empire, like I said. The Jews came you know, filled with awe and energy and vitality and this desire to recreate Zion. I mean, what a dream that What's was. What's Zion? What does that mean? Uh, the Zionist dream to go back and create a homeland. To their biblical homeland. A biblical homeland in Jerusalem. Okay, the continue. home of God. All right. And um, so more and more Jews came to that area. You, you know about the King David, uh, the bombing of the King David Tell Hotel. Me, is that still Israel had its own, today you would call it a terrorist group. One man's terrorist is another man's freedom fighter. They saw themselves as freedom fighters, the Irgun, groups like that led by Menachem Is this still in the 30s? This is in the 30s when the British now stopped the Jews from coming in. They blockaded that area. And in the darkest hour... Even in the 18% they stopped them? Yes. Them? In the Why? darkest hour of, of Jewish existence in Europe, when Hitler was out to annihilate every Jew in the world, the British blockaded, you couldn't get in. Well, to the 18%, why? What was their rationale? Their rationale was that the Arabs and the Jews can fight over this themselves. They can work it out, which they couldn't. The bombing why would the, they prohibit Jews from coming into that 18%? Because there was tremendous pressure on the British government to stop those European Even quote, during colonists. the Nazi time? Yes. Continue. Yeah. Now because continue with the, because the Grand Mufti of Jerusalem himself was in bed with Adolf Hitler. They worked together secretly to annihilate the Jews. Hitler was going to come to I Jerusalem see. to kill. And he worked with the Grand Mufti in Jerusalem to do that. So there was they, pressure from Hitler in some ways to restrict Israeli they did population not want from the growing. Jewish people and what they considered this is Arab land. Okay, continue. Somehow. Even though the Jews, like I said, are indigenous, they, their history is there, they diligently work to create a state. By 1947, uh, when uh, after the, the bombing of the King David Hotel, the British Empire washed their hands 
of the question of Palestine, Churchill said it best, that squalid little war, he called it, and he sent it to the newly formed United Nations after World War II, and he said, you guys deal with it. I see. In the United Nations, in April of 1947, the UN voted to partition what was left, that 18%. That 18%. That 18 they voted to partition that 18% into two homelands, one for the Arab Muslim and one for the Jews. I see. What, what they offered the Jews was not Jerusalem, just a little sliver along the coast, and mostly it was Negev Desert. About 80% was desert. I see. Uninhabitable. I see. But the Jews, being in such a dire predicament, said, thank God we'll take it. Thank God we'll take it. And on the day that uh, David Ben-Gurion declared the Jewish state, that um, was the first in May of 1948, the first prime minister, when he declared the independence of an independent, sovereign Jewish state, in Tel Aviv on that day, dancing in the streets all over the world. But on that same day, five Arab countries declared war on the nation state. Well, on that day? It? Yeah. To to strangle the baby in the crib. The UN the endorsed... A, a, the UN no, endorsed the vote. little, the smallest sliver of yep. the 18%, and the, the Arab the world vote, declared war. And there was on tremendous day. pressure on every country. Everyone was glued to their radios when the vote was taken in November of 1947. 1947 and the vote to partition the v final vote was 33 to 13 with 10 abstentions and like i said tremendous pressure How about the united the, states what the united states mean? voted in favor okay. 33 to 13 who were the 13 any of uh, note i i can't go through it right I'm now sorry. but, but sure. th they took that last 18 percent and divided it again into two homelands right the Jews said, it's not much, it doesn't even include you, Jerusalem, but thank God, after the war, you know. It didn't include Jerusalem. It didn't include, no. Continue. There was a man the bomb gate. That's just, they couldn't go into the old city. They were, couldn't go into the Temple Mount. Prohibited from going in there. Wow. Okay, okay they continue. couldn't have it. But they had something, finally. It was glorious. Okay. They danced in the streets. Thank God, after 2,000 years, a miracle. Historians wrote about this, saying this has never happened before for indigenous people to be gone two thousand years to keep their culture and religion intact in diaspora, and then to come back and reestablish it. What a great, glorious day! Okay. But five Arab countries not only declared war but came in to wipe out the country, really? to wipe out Israel. Every Jew, every man, woman, and child was now part of the military because they they had no place to go. They couldn't go to Germany. This was. They were fighting for their lives, literally. They lost 1% of their total population. Wow. How did they end? Fighting. All these big countries, these Arab countries, and then this little Israel because and the children. Because Israel was inspired because they had nothing to, not, they had no other place How did it end? Go. What ended up happening? Well, like I said, they lost 1% of their population, which doesn't sound like a lot. But if you take the United States, 300 million, that's that's over a million Americans. But that. they didn't, you would think that the Arabs then took the land back again and that was they, they Jews were inspired. They had to win. They had no choice. Every man, woman, child, everybody. And they lost a lot of people. Uh, they got help from some European, uh, Czechoslovakia. How about the United States? Uh, not much. Not much. But American pilots after World War II, Jewish pilots did go and help. They didn't have an air force. They so they, won, they somehow won the war. They and won now the war. And now what? Uh, but they never had a peace. That's the thing. They, uh, ah. they won the war. How did they win? What do you mean they won? If they didn't have a peace... They, they, they drove... Uh, they had a stalemate. Uh, and it, to this day, Israel has only made peace with its two immediate neighbors, e Egypt and Jordan. They have a cold peace, but at least it's been it's okay. held now since... So now since what happened? It's 48, the war's over, they managed to survive, No, without any peace agreement, nothing. What Then what? Well, then they, they won that war. But I want to tell you one story. Mm. My first cousin, mm. Zahava, tried to come in. She, she, her family, her parents came to uh, Haifa and their boat was captured and redirected to another British colony, Cyprus. Mm. She was born in a concentrated area in Cyprus mm. behind barbed wire because she was not permitted to go to Israel. Isn't that what they made the, the movie British. Exodus about? Yeah, it okay. was like the Exodus ship, exactly. Hundreds of these ships were turned away in the darkest hour. You can imagine they killed six million Jewish wow. people. Six million. And, they and their homeland, where they wanted to go, they couldn't go there either. They and couldn't sorry, go there and they couldn't I, go there. I wasn't, maybe I wasn't listening well. Why wasn't they, uh, that ship allowed to land in Israel? Because the British had a blockade. They Still the blockade. There was a blockade. They did not After want... the state of Israel was created. Uh, well, by, eight, by 48 it ended because there was okay. no one in the United States. But I'm talking up to 48. There okay, was a blockade. okay, continue. 
And uh, uh, since then, it's been a cold peace, like I said, with Egypt and Jordan. The rest of the Arab world, uh, uh, you know, it really staggers my, to this day, those civilians who were told by their own governments to leave when Israel was established, you remember I told you five countries declared war? Arab radios in Cairo and Damascus said to the civilians, leave, go to be safe, get out of the way. We're going to drive the Jew into the sea and then you'll come back to your land. Those people that left to this day, here it is, 2023, to, those, to this day, those people that left are still living in refugee camps off of UNRWA funds. The United Nations is still... And that's Why where the countries take them? Take they them? won't take them. They're saying they belong in Palestine and, and we're not going to take them. We won't assimilate it. Those people are not even permitted to work. They can't even, they're in wow. Lebanon, they're in Syria, they're in Jordan, they're in Egypt, in concentrated areas. Not allowed to work. No, these are refugee camps supplied... But these still, are Arabs. Why wouldn't they This is the in? only agency of the United Nations, UNRWA. The only agency dedicated specifically for Palestinian refugees, and that's where the suicide bombers come from. That's where the seething hatred, the squalor in those camps. They're not allowed to assimilate into the Arab population. They won't take them in, even though at the same time that all this is occurring, the Mizrahi Jews, these are Jews that lived among the Arab states for thousands of years in Syria and Jordan and Afghanistan. They were given 24 hours to leave. They expelled almost a million, almost as many Palestinians that left Palestine, they were told to go, as, as many, the same, the equivalent number, were now forced to go from Arab lands. Who took them in? Israel took them all in. The Yemenites, the Syrians, the Jordanians, all those Jews were taken in, assimilated, not put on farms or given menial jobs, but put in universities today, they're running the country. You said these, these Arabs who were expelled from Israel by the, the urging of the five Arab states, and you say may, some of them became suicide, but why aren't they angry at their Arab states? That's a good question. I rather than that. Israel. I always thought, well, propaganda works pretty good uh, because, you know, you're raised with that your whole life, that it's all the Israeli fault. The Jew put you here. It's not our problem. Mm -hmm. uh, but, yeah, a thinking person would say, wait a second, you mean for a whole generation since 1948, whole generations are born in these squalid camps and there's no way out? We can't live anywhere else? We can't get a job? Because they're still waiting to liberate uh, Palestine. That's one of the, what they're forward. holding on what's, for. From the, again, your historian's perspective, what's the next key moment that I and the viewers of this need to understand, to understand fairly the current Palestinian-Israeli situation. What you have to understand is Israel is a democracy, number one. And I mean a real, it's not like Democrats, Republicans. They had 23 uh, different political parties in the last election, and there are 120 seat Knesset. There's about 20 parties, including communists and Arab parties and religious parties. It's a true democracy. The number one um, job of a prime minister, of any leader, is to protect his people. Israel has voted left, right, They've tried everything in the world. They have offered peace a hundred times. The Arabs can have a country tomorrow. They can have peace tomorrow. All they have to do is lay down their arms, recognize Israel, and they have peace. No problem. Okay, let's walk through this. So, let's, let's go back so, to history. So let's go back. So what happened at well after forty eight? You I mean you told me off the air when we when we were preparing, just talking about this. You were talking about that that there are actually twenty four one percent Arabs in the uh, as citizens, they have full citizen rights, yeah. and they are they are members I want to of the Supreme talk Court. And, yeah. Yeah. But what 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 happened historically? To, I want to get I, to the point. What, why talk, has Israel created the kept the Golan Heights? Right. Why do they have black checkpoints? Well, what that? I really want to talk about is who are these Palestinians? These so-called Palestinians. Okay. First of all, there's no such thing as a Palestinian. If there is, we were the Palestinians. The Jews were the Palestinians. As you were saying earlier. Mm -hmm. If you look at the so-called Palestinians, they're Arabs, just like Jordanian Syrians. Who are they? They came in the 1930s for good paying jobs. You remember the area was a, an abandoned swamp, more or less. Underpopulated, no roads, no infrastructure. When the Jews came in and created tens of thousands of good paying jobs, they poured in from Egypt, from Syria, from... Arafat was an Egyptian. He wasn't a Palestinian, he was from Egypt. They came in for good paying jobs and they stayed. And as time went on, they became the Palestinians, which was laughable. Remember I told you in 72 when I first heard that there's going to be a Palestinian state? 
These are Palestinians. I was laughing. I thought it was a joke. So why is the world because embraced the Jews them? are the Palestinians. But the, abra- because, the world embraces them as because, a Palestinian Because people. like Goebbels said, if you repeat a big lie often enough and outrageous enough, it, then it's okay. acceptable. Continue. And now you look at the news and they even talk about the Palestinians or the Palestinian state. There's no such thing. Or the occupation. How can you occupy something that's yours? This is disputed territory, the so-called West Bank. It's disputed. It's not occupied. This is ancient Palestine. This is th- those are all Jewish cities in there, Hebron and all the rest of it. So, t- I won't move the conversation as you will. I know there have been other wars. Is this relevant to sixty-seven war and a seventy-three? I mean, or do we need to move? Because I want my viewers to fully understand what is causing the worldwide. There's a great deal of there's some support for Israel, but there's a lot of antipathy. Where should we continue the conversation as we move it's to start? It's sad for me. It's sad for me to see the left in America, especially, uh, denigrate Israel and call it a, an occupying uh, colonial European power. That but they do have checkpoints, and, and they do have they do well, they maybe <laughs> take, they've taken the way. The, well, I think uh, there'd be Holland checkpoints Heights. here in Oakland too if people were shooting at you and came in with the idea of. Are really the are the are the are the Muslims really shooting? What's the reality? At least, again, the reality is talking. that, uh, on, and this makes me very sad, but the hatred is so deep and so a part of the culture. It's in the education system. It's 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 reiterated every day by their educators, by their uh, religious leaders, and the hatred is just so intense. They haven't prepared the population to live in peace with the Israelis. What they do is they prepare the population to expel and annihilate the Jew and take it all over. When they talk about, you know, Palestine, they talk about from the river to the sea. They don't include Israel. And they, they have no idea that there's a very no famous person named it. Hadid or whatever who chants again and again. She has millions of followers. Something like from you know Palestine, meaning the Arabs are going to yeah. obliterate, throw the Jews into the sea. And I want to ask you a question: How can there be thirty-nine independent Arab states, six fifty-seven Muslim states? Why? Is this little tiny Israel a problem for the world? It's a democratic country. These are the indigenous people. It's the size of New Jersey. It doesn't threaten anybody. I you know, know, the world should should <laughs> should rejoice at the establishment of Israel guess, and what they produce for the world and what they do. I guess my best guess is that for historic times, the Jews have maybe way back in antiquity were never they. Didn't, they began in the Middle East where they had it wasn't their physical strength but they had to use their brains to survive in a desert yeah. and so it became very valued as people chose their spouse somebody who was going to be intelligent and so that started a culture way 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 back when of valuing intelligence and achievement and we all, when we are confronted with, and so for a thousand years there's been this people that have prized itself on their intelligence and therefore, and drive, and so they've succeeded. And so, it succeeded in excess of their percentage of the population in science and whatever. And it's a natural human tendency to feel jealous or feel you know, hit upon. I always call Jews clever. Uh, as though their intelligence is pushing people down. So from the Roman times, through the Inquisition, through the, uh, the, the pogroms, through the Holocaust, through today's anti-Semitism, there is a lot of jealousy, and that's going to... Uh, my best shot is that, that all of this, ultimately, this, this double standard by which Israel and Jew is treated is a result of human natural jealousy. Do you buy that analysis? Well, human beings need somebody to blame for their for their problems. They need a scapegoat, and the Jews provide a perfect target. They're a minority. They dress differently. They eat different food. They're the people of the book. They're the, the God's chosen people. They produce so much. Uh, the genome showed the brain power of the Ashkenazi Jew, and uh, that doesn't sit well with a lot of people. Who are these people? And for two thousand years, we slept with our with our shoes under our pillow, ready to go. I and mean, you had to be strong and wise and feisty just to survive. So, are you saying that the presence of the checkpoints to is to avoid suicide? I mean, there have been 
I mean, what is this paranoid on the Jew on the Israelis' <laughs> part? Why do they have checkpoints? Why, you know, why? Whenever I open the San Francisco Chronicle, I see an Israeli holding a machine gun. What is the re, is, being a statesman? What is the statesmanlike answer as to why there is such con, these behaviors that some of the world hates, like checkpoints and etc. Why is that, is that paranoia on the part of these? I think it goes back thousands of years. It's part of their DNA, and it goes back to the deicide, you know, the so-called Christ killers. Uh, it's in the DNA of every European, going back to the Dark Ages. You told me before we got in the air that there were more recent things there, that there are there are bombs being sent into Israel from terrorist groups, uh, Al Shabazz and whatever. I don't remember the names of them. You know, there's this city called Sterot and there's constant bombings and then their bar mitzvahs have been bombed <laughs> by Arabs and, and cafes and the buses. Is that the real reason why all well, for the security or is it more complex than that? I think, you know, if you live in a size, uh, in a country the size of Vermont, you're surrounded by people who want to kill you and 20% of your population inside Israel are Arabs, you're going to protect yourself. That's natural human instinct. And they've had so many experiences, like you said, in nightclubs and buses, wherever. They're constantly looking over their shoulder. This is why they elected Netanyahu, to protect them, to be strong. They don't hate anybody. They're not, they're not uh, threatening anybody. They want to be just like you and me. They want to be left alone so they could produce and create and have a family and love and, and do something good for the world. What really surprised me was, you know, I always think that most people, even though the, even a lot of the, the general citizenry in Nazi Germany ended up being supportive of Nazism. But I like to think that most people just want to live their lives. But when I heard, it was now maybe a decade, you'll have to correct me, or so ago, the Arabs in Israel, uh, the pal quote, the, what now is called the Palestinians, elected Hamas as their government, which is sworn by charter to destroy Israel to push all the Jews into the sea. Right. That made me think that maybe there is a legitimate basis for the checkpoints for wanting to take parts of the land that are like um, important to maybe defend against. Is that is how important? How emblematic of the antipathy to the Jewish people and Israel is the fact that the the Palestinian population elected Hamas, which is sworn to its destruction, the Jews' destruction. Uh, not just did they elect Hamas, but look at the West Bank, where they elected Mahmoud Abbas, who did his PhD thesis on Holocaust denial. Uh, he's into his... In 18th... favor of Holocaust denial? Yeah. Well, no, not in favor. Yeah, 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 yeah. His, yeah, he's a denier. He wrote his I PhD see. thesis in Moscow on that. He's always seen as a moderate. Mo well, because moderate. the world... You know, just like you can't say Netanyahu without ultra conservative, you know, radical. He was elected by the people, okay, to protect them. This guy Abbas is in his 18th year of his first four year term of the palace, right? The head of right, the Palestinians, right. the, the, the Arab world has no real uh history uh involving itself in democratic rule. It's uh, you look at every country there, kingdoms like Saudi Arabia, yeah, kingdoms, totalitarian states, the people. Um, have lived like that for centuries. They, uh, you remember the Arab Spring? We had a lot of hope that something would happen. Look where they're living. Israel is, I believe, a shining example of, of a true democratic state with active political parties and a healthy debate in the country. Uh, a Supreme Court that's going through some ra uh, needed um, uh, reforms right now. It was leftist, and I understand it's moving toward the right. What's that? The Supreme Court, the Israeli Supreme Court. Well, one has to understand that Israel doesn't have a constitution like the United States with checks and balances. Mm. The Supreme Court of Israel is a figment of the Knesset, and over years Knesset it has evolved. It has evolved. Senate. It's 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 a, a com, it's a compilation of laws that created that, mm -hmm. and over time they've taken so much power for themselves. They even decide who collects garbage in Tel Aviv. Mm -hmm. It's gotten to the point where uh, they can usurp any power they want and. Uh, Let's move to a summary. Yeah, yeah, because Quick. we're talking about yeah, internal well, yeah, right. yeah, Israeli really, politics, oh, me, just, which need reform. My fault. I probably shouldn't even brought it up. <laughs> um, let's capstone this. Let's summarize. So what is the most, and I want you to put your statesman hat on, you know, fair-minded. What is 
the one message that is most important for our viewers to take away about the current Palestinian-Israeli situation. Israel is an independent democratic state of Jewish people that live in their indigenous homeland that threaten no one, that seeks peace with all their neighbors, and that can happen when the Arab states recognize Israel. Didn't you say that the twice that the the uh, that the Israelis agreed to major major concessions? and that was turned down by the Arabs because they don't want to compromise? Is that well, accurate? Well, historically, it's always been land for peace. Take the Sinai Peninsula, which is mm -hmm. twice the size of Israel, with oil and tourist areas. Israel handed over the entire Sinai Peninsula, which they captured in a defensive war in 1967, right up to the Suez Canal. They handed all that over to Egypt for a piece of paper, peace. And it's been a very cold piece, but it's held essentially since 1967. Let's just end by telling us uh, you've written a book called Torn Lilacs, which I, I looked, uh, I have read part of, and I also looked on the Amazon reviews. I've never seen a book that has 185 reviews, all of which are five stars. I mean, any author can get a few people to, you know, or his friends to write reviews, but you have 185. 187 this morning. Excuse me. <laughs> what? Tell me about. Tell me about the book. It's a book that had to be written. It's the true story of what my parents went through during the Second World War. Uh, I characterize it as a love story, because uh, it was they met just as the war was starting. They were betrothed to one another. It's a beautiful story of loss, separation, how they found each other, betrayal. It has all the elements of great literature, I think. But it's primarily a love story, and it takes place in Siberia and Kazakhstan, which is unwritten about. Mm. Most, quote, Holocaust stories uh, take place in Auschwitz in Europe and the struggle there for resistance. Mm. So this story takes place, like I said, Siberia, Kazakhstan, where I was born. Uh, and it's an amazing story of uh, hope and redemption, uh, defiance, and love. Last and, question. And I'm very proud of it. You and I are both getting older. And we both off the air. We, the reason we're doing this, we talked about legacy and the importance of legacy. And um, what's what's next? What do you care about now, the Henry Mikulski, the human being, as you enter your, you know, hopefully, you know, a long time? But you know, yeah. well, I care about my health, of course, and my family, and all the things yeah. that one would care about. But I am dedicating the remainder of my days that God allows me. Uh, to promoting this book because I think the book is a very important statement when you read it you understand that the Jewish people need an independent homeland they can't live in Poland or among the Europeans anywhere history has proven that and yet I don't hammer the reader over the head with politics mm -hmm. the characters lives play it all out and they make it emphatic that the Jewish people do need a place where they can breathe easy and not look over their shoulder every two minutes well, and, and create like anybody else in love well, I think you have, I'm pleased, really pleased that you have chosen to create um, a real good history. We took our time, and I think, I hope that our listeners really benefited, and I thank you for being my guest <laughs> on my How to Do Life podcast. Yeah. Thank you for having me, Marty. Yeah. As usual, uh, I welcome your thumbs up and accept your thumbs down. I always look forward to your comments and especially like it if you hit the share button below. If you're watching this on YouTube, share with your uh, whoever, your social media, so that our efforts here, my efforts, uh, can have broader impact. And as usual, I'm flattered if you subscribe to my channel, whether it be on YouTube or the podcast. I like to end my podcast with this, I think, is a, is a, it's a, a quote that I've used for decades, but it feels more relevant now than ever and maybe particularly relevant to this particular topic that we just discussed, the, the history of, uh, of Israel and what its implications are for today's Israel. And that quote doesn't come from me. It comes from a guy named, a writer named Frank A. Clark. We find comfort among those who agree with us, growth among those who don't.